Welcome, and I'm going to tell you some ways to use Google Earth and what tools and tricks there are to using the application. So the first thing that I want to bring to your attention is the bar down here at the bottom of the page. So we have information being displayed there. Um, I'm not going to keep my mouse on it because the information changes with the location of your mouse. So I'm just going to put it in one spot and leave it there. So we have the imagery date. This is the last time that this specific spot had a satellite capture the imagery that you're seeing. So in this case, it was January 23rd of 2015. It's really interesting to look at the different imagery dates. Um, there's another tool that I'll show you later on that lets you look at older images. And this can let you see how the area changes over time or if there has been a catastrophic um, occurrence like a tsunami, a tornado, things like that. All right, our next part on that bar is our geographic coordinates. The coordinates given in this specific spot are where my mouse is hovering over. So, in this spot, we are at 37 degrees, 7 minutes, 25.13 seconds north. And then after that, we have 95 degrees, 41 minutes, and 35.24 seconds west. It will always go north or south, and then east or west. That will always be the order no matter what. <clears throat> this is important to know because even a slight variant on where you are will give you a different image, different location. Great example of this is if I type in where my own house is on Google Earth, it shows up about half a mile down the road. So obviously it's not always perfect. The data is corrupted. <clears throat> All right, so next up on our list of our bar is the elevation. Again, this varies on where your mouse is. So right where my mouse is right now is 828 feet above sea level. Now I can change my units to meters and I'm going to show you how in a minute. But it's useful to know feet if that's what you're used to. If I moved my mouse, I would have a different elevation though. It's an, there's an easier way to figure out that information. I'm going to show you that in a little bit. And then we have the eye altitude. And what the eye altitude is, is how far are you from the surface of what you're looking at up? And what this is actually useful for is say your teacher tells you, okay, I want you to go 200 miles up tell me what you notice. Or, I want you to go one mile up, tell me what you notice. And these are going to give you two very different scaled maps. So that's something very, very important to know. All right, next thing I'm gonna cover is how to find and change your units. So, what you have to do is go to Tools and then go to Options. Once you're in Options, go to Show Lat Longe, that stands for Latitude and Longitude. Decimal degrees are popular, but they're hard to remember if you're trying to go between Google Earth and a piece of paper. So I suggest degrees, minutes, seconds. It's my favorite way of doing it. It's easier to remember things with. I can break things up. <clears throat> Then we have the units of measurements right next to that. System default depends on where you are in the world and what your computer is running. If you're running a computer that defaults automatically to metric, that's what you're going to be defaulting to. If you're running a computer that automatically defaults to feet, that's what you're going to be running. However, you can change that manually. Right now, I have mine set in feet miles. You can set it for meters, kilometers. 
which is more often what you're going to be using when actually measuring occurrences in nature. So say that I changed something. I would just hit OK, and then my change is done. <clears throat> All right, so let's go to the top row of what we have to look at. This blue button here is just our hide the sidebar. That's all it does. Just hide our sidebar so you don't have to see it. it gives you a little bit more um, view of the area you're looking at. I prefer to have the sidebar out. You can actually see your resources that are on your left side. Okay, our next one is, I sometimes accidentally call them pin cushions, but they're actually not that. They're thumbtacks. What the thumbtacks are useful for is marking your place. So this is actually my college. And if I wanted to mark something at my college, say where I'm at right now, which is approximately right there, I would go like this. So I would just put the pin cut, I would just put the thumb tack, tack in and then I can move it around with my mouse. You can only move it while you still have this Google Earth New Place Mark window up. And then I would name it something. It's best to name them, otherwise you're just gonna get a bunch of unnamed thumbtacks. But what I like about this is it gives me the exact latitude and longitude of the thumbtack, which is very beneficial. Um, sometimes, you might have a teacher who will change where the thumbtack is. Like they'll take it 50 feet in the air, 100 feet in the air. If you're doing something with atmospheres and they're trying to get you to learn the atmospheric layers, that might be something they might do. So I just put OK and there's my thumbtack. All right, the next thing that is really easy to do and I like using, if I need to bring attention to a certain part of an area is I use the polygon feature. So say I wanted to highlight this part of the Gladstone Bay and this is the marina over in Gladstone actually. All I'd do is do that and then I can you know name it so I'd call it the marina. Always make sure you click into your window. I forget that. I forget that a lot. And then you can change the style and color, which is actually um, something that you'll see a lot of the teachers do if they're trying to get you to look like an air mask or something. Because you can do that. You can make it kind of not as dense and see through. And you can see where it's at. So it's not just a blob on your screen. Works better that way. All right, our next spot is going to be we're going to go down to Sleeping Bear Dunes and what I have down here is a good spot to do some paths. So to do a path all you have to do is put a bunch of dots basically. That's all you got to do. Bop. And then name it. So I'll call this Little Bear because I didn't go all the way out. <clears throat> and then hit OK. Now, to have a good use of this, hit show elevation. All you have to do is right click on your path and hit show elevation profile. And what this is going to do is open this. These are the elevations along your path. These are actual readings. There's my maximum for the path. It's 644 feet. I know mine says 643. I can't exactly get it right up there. But this nice little bar here says what the max is, what the minimum is, and what my average is. So my maximum is 644. My minimum is 581. My average is 593. It also tells me what my distance is, which is really nice to know, especially if you're trying to figure out gradients in a river. So say I was measuring a river instead, 
I could see what the change of elevation is between two points and then have a accurate measurement between the two points as to what their distance was. So that's a really useful tool. I highly recommend using it. All right, our next resource is going to be this image overlay button. And oftentimes, um, you as students um, won't use it, but a teacher might. Or if you're trying to show a friend something at a specific spot, or another classmate, or maybe you guys are doing a project, this is what you're gonna be using. This allows you to overlay an image onto the actual earth. Um, this is Chapel Rock up by Munising. So what's nice is if I want to say use this for myself for something else, there's the link for it. So it's really easy. You don't have to download the image and input it into a file or anything. It's just linked in. <clears throat> All right. The next button is the record a tour button. I don't use this. Maybe your teacher might, um, or maybe if you're trying to show a classmate something that they missed, you might. But otherwise, I don't use it. And the reason is, I don't have a reason to. But it could be useful if, you know, a friend missed something and they need to see a certain area and you don't want to give them the answer straight off. All right, our next bot is, remember how I mentioned going back in time and the imagery dates? All right, so the last imagery here was back in 2014. Well, if I hit this little button right here, that's the little clock, I can go back as far as 1993. Doesn't that look a lot different than what it does now? As you can see, some satellite imagery, even up to the 1990s, was in black and white. You're going to come across that often. But this is really beneficial if you're doing an analyzation in an area that has tsunamis, earthquakes, things like of that nature, because you can see what happened to the area. All right. This next tool, if you get dizzy, don't look at the screen. Um, I had a friend look at the screen while I was playing with it and I got yelled at. <clears throat> okay, see how the earth is split with black and with darkness and light? I can adjust where the sun is. This projects where the sun is on any certain day. Pretty cool. What is useful for this tool is if you're doing anything with the equinoxes, the solstices, or trying to figure out what area is going to get sun first. All right, now that we've played with that. Um, this next one is more just for fun than it is for academic purposes unless your teacher assigns you something in that. You have the sky, Mars, and the moon. All of these spots do have tours to go on, um, but in a physical geography course that is concentrating on the earth, you're probably not going to use them. All right, so our next thing is that little ruler. All you have to do is click it, click one spot, and then click another. And then you have your marks. So going across the Hudson Bay, at that spot, 952.8 kilometers. If I wanted it in miles instead, it's 592.04 miles, which is useful. Your teachers are probably gonna have you doing that a lot. <clears throat> All right, these next four buttons, I'm not gonna go over, over too much. You have the email button, which is useful if you're trying to show someone a specific thing. Um, Maybe your own teacher. I've never had to use it though. This next button is the print button. So if I want to print a screenshot of this, I could. 
This button lets you save the image. So if I wanted an image of this, if I wanted an image of Reindeer Lake here, I could print the image. Or if I wanted to view it in Google Maps, I could use it. Next up, over to your right, we have a compass. This, if you grab onto the end, just lets you maneuver where you're looking. So if you double click the end, it will um, orient you so north is straight up. If you just want to move around a little bit, this is just like a joystick um, from a video game controller. This adjusts your altitude so you can go up and down. And then if you wanted to have a ground view, just put the little orange man on the ground and he'll zoom you all the way in. And this is useful if you're trying to look for like little bumps in the land, um, things like that. You normally would use that a lot if um, you're in a city area and you're trying to look for something that was connected to people um, because then you could use that in relation to roads and get good imagery. All right, over to our left, we have places. The places give you what you're looking at. This is a good spot to save what you're looking at so you can go back to, um, or you might have a KMZ file like I do that you download and then you have to go through and look through the file. So that's where you'll find that. If you're going to save anything and you're going to come back to it, make sure it's not under temporary places. I can't tell you how many times I've lost something because it was under temporary places. And then we have the layers. The layers gives you different um, resources. I only normally keep on the borders and labels because it's typically the only thing I need. Sometimes I need photos and I'll turn it on when I need it. Otherwise, the more section, unless I'm looking for something very specific in it, is not um, generally applicable. The global awareness, again, very specific. Gallery, while it does have some usefulness, um, it's not always um, like useful because it just bogs down your computer, really. The weather, I've only ever had issues with this actual layer. Um, the oceans, it's a lot more of just, okay, click on this and we'll tell you about it than it is showing you anything. 3D images and buildings, you have to be in a certain spot that they've done the renderings. Roads, yeah, it's useful, but not always accurate. Um, the photos, panorama is normally pretty good, and so is the 3D city one. Places is just going to bog down your screen. But borders and labels is definitely the best. If you haven't watched my previous video, make sure the new Google Earth is turned off. It's just going to pop up and drive you mad. Um, and then you have your search bar up here. And you can look in the history. If you had different searches there, you can get directions, things like that. And that's pretty much how to run Google Earth um, and use the basic tools and not get overwhelmed with it. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments section. Thank you.